We are, yes, as has been said numerous times, it is Palm Sunday. It's one of those Sundays that, that ticks round once a year and we suddenly look at a particular passage. Well, let's look at it. Let's pull up, if you've got your Bible, Matthew chapter 21. You can find the same story in all four Gospels. That's something to suggest that this is significant. Uh, but we're going to read it in Matthew and we're going to do the first 17 verses of Matthew chapter 21. It will probably pitch up on screen as well. Matthew, first book of the New Testament. Matthew, the, the gospel that was written to the Jews to, to help them understand who Jesus was, uh, referencing all of the backstory of the, the way that God had interacted with his people. It says this, As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethage at the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said, as soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say, the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. Wouldn't it be nice if that worked the way for us, yeah? Just like, oh, I see that, with that song earlier on, uh, what wonder, what transport. You're kind of pitching for a car, a bike, what are you going for? A Tesla. <laughs> The Lord needs them and will immediately let you take them. Verse 4. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Jerusalem, Look, your king is coming to you. He is humble and riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. And the two disciples did as Jesus commanded, and they brought the donkey and the colt to him, and they threw garments over the colt, and he sat on it. And most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and the others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Hosanna, or praise God, for the son of David. It's worth saying, Hosanna, literal translation means save now. Save now, save now, for the son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heavens. And the entire city of Jerusalem was in uproar as he entered. Who is this? They asked. And the crowd replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple. That's the first thing that was a little bit odd. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all of the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those who were selling doves. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law saw those wonderful miracles and heard even the children in the temple shouting, praise God for the son of David. But, but the leaders were indignant. They asked Jesus, do you hear what these children are saying? Yes, Jesus replied. It's like, duh, yeah. Haven't you heard or haven't you ever read the scriptures? For they say, you have taught children and infants to give you praise. And then he returned to Bethany where he had stayed overnight. It's a good chunk of scripture. It's a, an encouragement to read. It's something that I'd encourage you, take away, take some time over the this week, today even, read, read it in the different passages, the different uh, Gospels. But I love that, that in one sense, Palm Sunday can be summed up in a clip from Shrek 2. Now, if you're old enough, you'll remember that there, Shrek 2 is, a, is this idea where uh, Princess Fiona, finally having become an ogre in the first film, uh, is then invited back to the, the magical kingdom, da di da di da with her husband to be welcomed back into the family fold, having now finally, they believed, returned to her princess state rather than being an ogre. And so this whole crowd gathers round as uh, the carriage enters into the city, and, and people form a procession because they expect Fiona to be, and, and her husband, to be something that it turns out very rapidly that they aren't. And they get to that that moment where everybody around them is saying, this is it, this is it, this is it, and the doors open to the carriage, the doves are let go, and at that moment, out onto the red carpet steps two ogres. At which point, the whole crowd go, oh, 
and there's a bird in the clip, flies into a brick wall and just falls dead. And it kind of amazingly sums up what Palm Sunday would have been like for the people who were there, so much so that it's the perfect illustration. We use it every time we do Y sessions where we explain to, to hundreds of kids about what Easter is and why it actually happened. But let's pick up on that, the shock factor that's in there. In verse 10, the entire city of Jerusalem was in uproar as he entered. Who is this? Who is this, they asked. It's probably one of the, the biggest questions that we should ask in general in life. Who is this? When you're talking to someone, who are you talking to? It's worth finding out who they are. Sometimes that might get you out of trouble in future. You discover very rapidly, if you're talking about somebody to somebody else that you discover is their sister, you might get in trouble. Yeah? It's, it, who is this is a really good question to start with. And that question echoes through the whole of this passage. The city is in uproar. Just picture this for a few moments. This is not your everyday occurrence. Jerusalem was not the kind of city that every single day there was chaos and riot and, and crowds and processions. It wasn't the norm for them. This is a significant day. It's a significant day because they are welcoming in somebody who is, in their minds, a celebrity. Someone who is so well known that they've all been gagging to see this guy and see the miracles that he's performed. And they've just not had the opportunity because, to be honest, social media didn't exist. The TV didn't exist. They didn't get broadcast of what Jesus was doing. They just heard. And they were looking forward to seeing this celebrity. This leader, this potential leader, somebody who they genuinely believed had the ability to transform their situation. A new leader for their city, a new leader because these were, were people who were beaten down by the Romans. They'd been invaded decades before and had no authority, no power of their own. The Romans had control. And in the middle of that, you've got this procession coming in. And the question being asked, who is this? Who are you? And depending on the answer people give, depends how you respond, isn't it? Depending on the, the answer that you give for who Jesus is, depends on how you respond to him completely. So we're going to look just for a little bit this morning through some of the responses that the people gave when they were looking at Jesus, the, the crowd as they were talking about it. Let's go to Matthew 21, verse 11. You can see it in there. The crowds replied. What did they reply? It's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Don't you just love crowds? They say that the individuals are smart, but people as groups are stupid. Uh, Claire used to have a T-shirt that uh, never, said, never underestimate the stupidity of boys in big groups. And it, it's an unfortunate truth that when people get together, sometimes they, they kind of part the brains off to one side. The crowd here go for the shallow answer. Because Jesus had been famous in Galilee. Galilee, the, the northern region. Galilee, the whole area, the region where Jesus had actually come from. It was his hometown. He had done all of the, the, the early miracles, turning water into wine and, and doing all sorts of other stuff around the area, healing people. They hook in the title prophet because prophet gives a really nice vague answer, doesn't it? Oh, what are you? I'm a prophet. Well, what does that mean? Somebody who speaks God's words. It doesn't, doesn't acknowledge who Jesus was in terms of significance and power, but it sounds good, yeah? Yeah? We ever given someone a title? I don't know if you've ever been at work and known somebody who's had a title that means almost nothing. Or maybe you're one of those people who are, you've, you've been through a reorganization at work and suddenly you become a manager when you don't manage anybody. That, those sort of weird titles. Often words are used to make something sound better than it actually is. But it can be used in the other way. You think of the airports around here. You have London Gatwick, well, ish. London Heathrow, ish. 
London Luton, London Stansted, London South End. Like, really? They are using the tag London to try and make those airports seem more central than they are. Well, they were using the, the term prophet in one sense to kind of give a vague, well, we don't know about Jesus. We'll, we'll just badge him with this vague title. But they go the next step. They twist it just a little bit more. The prophet from Nazareth. What do we know about Nazareth? It's, it's not a great place. I don't know what you consider to be the, um, the, the least desirable place in the UK is, and don't answer that before we get into trouble. <laughs> okay? We, we could all get into trouble very rapidly. But we know that, that when Jesus had first been mentioned to Nathaniel way, way, way back before Jesus had even uh, been baptized, right at the very beginning, I think, of John, Nathaniel turns around and says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Because it is the, literally the, the butt end of, of the country. Nowhere significant, nowhere of any value. Nothing good comes from there. And so they're name-checking Nazareth. They're kind of hedging their bets. You know, they're sort of saying, yeah, he's a prophet. He's someone we're sort of interested in. This is kind of exciting. There's a parade. It's great. We love a crowd. But he's also from Nazareth. So we're not going to put too much stake on what he's saying. They're not bought in. They're not all bought in. They're, they're just, they're, they're there. They're curious. Exactly, I think, as Michael said, that how things can change in a week. But they did, most of them, lay down their coats on the floor. They did make the equivalent of a, a red carpet. They did then use the, uh, the palm leaves to try and signify some additional status to try and honour Jesus, but a little bit half-hearted. So let's look at one of the other titles. Matthew 21 verse 9 says this, Jesus was in the centre of the procession and the people all around him were shouting, praise God or Hosanna for the son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heaven. The son of David. That kind of doesn't make sense because as far as people would have thought of in real life, Jesus was the son of Joseph. We know slightly different to that. So where does this son of David term come from? Well, it's a messianic term. It's a term that is a, a shorthand for the Messiah. The expected king, the one who has been prophesied and promised long ago in the Old Testament, who was going to come and redeem God's people. Yeah, come and redeem the Israelites. Come and set them free. That was the, the, the language that was around it. Give you a little bit of a foundation for that. It first starts to, to form in 2 Samuel, verse, uh, chapter 7, verses 16 and 17. You find that David has, at this point, offered to, to build God a temple to try and honor him. And Nathan, the prophet, is, is asked in and kind of goes, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, except on the way out... God speaks to Nathan and says, David's killed too many people. You're going to have to wait for his son, but you can go and give this message. And the message that comes back to David says this, your house and your kingdom will continue before me for all time, and your throne will be secured forever. And so Nathan went back to David and told him everything that the Lord had said in the vision. This idea, this promise, not of a few years of, of kingship, not of a, a few descendants, but for all time and forever. It then develops in Scripture. We can jump on uh, Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah is a great book. It's sometimes a little, under, little confusing to get your head around, but it's worth reading if you, you take the time. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 and 2 says this, Out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot, yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. And the Spirit of God will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Because the tree that had grown up from David's family had, had started off, all right, but had soon enough split the kingdoms, the north, Israel, the south, Judah, 
gradually they'd, they'd gone haywire and, and gone all over the show. And instead of a, a nice strong tree growing up, you end up with two branches, one of which fizzles out and dies pretty rapidly. And the other, Judah, the south, lasts for a little bit longer, another hundred years, but eventually it's kaput. They're all taken away into exile. The stump of the tree, for want of uh, the, using the biblical illustration, has been capped. And yet, Isaiah is prophesying that from that stump, a new shoot, yes, a branch bearing fruit from the old root will grow. Another prophet from a similar time, Jeremiah 33, 14 to 16, says this, The day will come, says the Lord, when I will do for Israel and Judah all the good things that I have promised for them. In those days and at that time, I will raise up a righteous descendant from, the da- the, from Dave, King David's line. Sorry, let me say that again. In those days and at that time, I will raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line. And he will do what is right and just. Throughout the land. And in that day, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this will be its name. The Lord is our righteousness. Jehovah Sidon Tsendu. The term Messiah, the term Son of David, becomes this useful shorthand, a way to refer to a character that they know something about, but they don't actually have a, a fleshed out full ID with, the, with his social security number and all the rest of it. They, they know what they're roughly expecting, but they don't know what he looks like. In the last week, being stuck, not do, able to do much more than move from a bed to a chair and a chair to a bed, I binged watched or finished binge watching the whole of Line of Duty. I was a little bit late to the party on that one. And for those of you who've watched it or, or maybe not, there is Constantly across the series, there are references to a, uh, a fourth man, uh, somebody by the name of H, or, the, or somebody else called the Caddy. These characters that are unknown, but you know that they're somebody. They're a suspect, but they haven't been able to put a face and a name to them, but you've got a title, a placeholder. That's kind of the same thing that was going on with the idea that that the son of David was there. They knew sort of what they were expecting, this this saviour figure. They sort of knew what he was going to do, that he was going to save them. But they did the, the very thing that we are sometimes dangerous in doing, is that they took scripture and they just applied it at face value to their situation without even giving a little bit of a thought as to, is this, is this it? Is this context that we need to look at? And so they interpreted that line that I just read out. In that day, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will be in safety. And they gave it an immediate application. They were thinking the son of David is going to turn up and Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will be in safety. That's why they were shouting Hosanna. Hosanna. That's why they were, were shouting those phrases about being saved. Because they thought Jesus was the guy who was going to come in and kick the butt of the Romans to save them. Yeah? Jesus was the one that was expected to be the strong man. The the man who was going to come in and and provide safety, security, uh, redemption, giving them freedom from their captors. Because they needed that. They expected it. And probably a bit like you and I, They always assumed that their problems were because of outside factors. They turned around and said, why are we in a mess? Well, it's because of the Romans. And and we might turn around and say, well, why why am I having trouble? Well, it's because of my boss. Or it's because of the, the, the council. Or it's because of the government. Because we like to apply things out. Jesus kind of applies things in. Does things a bit different. And so you can see why that turnaround in people's expectations would have been so rapid. Because the first thing that Jesus did wasn't to go to the the garrison and go and start attacking the Romans. He didn't take this procession of people who were there as a mini army ready to to rebel. Because Jerusalem was known for being a somewhat rebellious place. He instead goes up the main street. Instead of turning right to the garrison, he turns left and goes to the temple. He starts challenging 
the people's expectations of themselves. When we allow force Jesus to be identified within our own limitations, to pigeonhole him as our ideal saviour, then it's so easy for him to disappoint us. If we say that that Jesus has to, to save us by making us wealthy, by making us healthy, by making us strong and successful, well, we're, we're pigeonholing Jesus in a way that the Bible never does. And then when we aren't always healthy, or aren't always wealthy, or aren't always successful, suddenly we, we struggle, don't we? That's exactly what the Jews did. They had pigeonholed Jesus into this person who was going to come and... and redeem them in one go, in one day, save them, help them to to go walking off on clouds for the rest of their lives. And it didn't work out that way because Jesus was doing something more significant. That's how come the crowd could turn around. That's how come the crowd could take where he was and spin it round. See, the interesting thing is, is that, I don't know if you've noticed, but Palm Sunday is actually the day that the Jews would have been getting their lambs for Passover. We're the right number of days out. You check with Exodus. The right number of days out that they would have had to have gone and collected their lamb. The lamb that would have lived with them for a few days in the household, been petted and, and, oh, cutie, cutie, before it became roast lamb at Passover. Isn't it interesting? That's the day that Jesus enters Jerusalem. The same day the Paschal Lamb enters the household, Jesus entered Jerusalem. Because he knew that he was doing something way more significant, way more important than just dealing with the the, the current issues of an employer or the current issues of the Romans invading or the current issues that, that face us to do with health and wealth and wisdom. He was dealing with something much more deeply rooted. And so we end up with this question that's being asked, who am I? We're looking at Jesus, who is he? And we're going to go to Matthew 16. Because Matthew 16 includes the the great confession where Peter opens his big mouth, which he does so often, and says something that's really significant. He follows it up a few, few moments later by saying something stupid, but, but at this, this point, this is good. Matthew 16, we're going to read thir- verses 13 to 16 and then jump to 20 and 21. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied as they gathered their thoughts, Some say John the Baptist. It's a bit like the Stig, isn't it, from a few years ago. Some say dot, dot, dot. Well, some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, verse 16, answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then, verse 20, he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. And from then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly. Notice that he told them plainly, and they still didn't get it. Sometimes, all of us as disciples can be a little bit dumb. Just the truth. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem, that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. There's a song that's decades upon decades old now by the Who. Who are you? The refrain goes on again and again and again. Who are you? Who, who are you? It was never meant to be something that that was anything more than a catchy tune, in one sense. It was a hook. We could all ask that question when we're faced with someone we don't recognise. Who are you? Yet according to uh, the 1985 Pete Towshed, um, My Generation radio special, the song came out different than intended when Roger Daltrey sang it. 
He said, the song became a prayer from a destitute man, the man on the streets, looking up into the sky and asking God, who are you? Who are you? How we answer that question regarding God makes a massive impact of how we will live our lives. The thing is, the, the religious leaders recognized who Jesus was. From the very earliest days, when they saw that Jesus was doing the miracles that he was doing, they recognized that there was something significant about him. They sent people to test him, to ask him questions, to observe him. That was standard protocol for identifying potential messiahs. They recognized that he did miracles, that he healed people, that he completed the, the tests that were identified in Isaiah as being messianic acts. Isaiah 35, verses 5 to 6a, says this, When he comes, you might have it on the screen, uh, he will open the eyes of the blind. He will unplug the ears of the deaf. The lame will leap like a deer, and those who cannot speak will sing. Those four things, categoric signs of the Messiah. Jesus completed every single one of those, time after time after time. Can I have the band up, please? Yet they didn't want to accept him. Isn't that the shocker? They didn't want to accept him because if they accepted him, it would require them to change. It would require them to adjust how they had chosen to live. It would require them to do something different in the way that they managed the temple. Not just making the profit out of it, not just milking it for money, but instead doing something that was going to be significant about following God and submitting to him. The thing that's terrifying about Palm Sunday is that it's the church leaders, effectively, who missed who Jesus was. They saw and they chose not to follow. It was those who were, were religious and or aware of what was going on, the things of God, that chose not to follow him. Today, most of us in this room or watching online will probably know off the heart that, that God, Jesus is God. You'd probably willingly amen that. If I say Jesus is God, see, we know it. That's great. But let's be brutally honest at this point. The church, collective, this is a church, but I'm talking about the church, is as corrupted now as the temple was corrupted then. As corrupted now as when Jesus walked in with a whip and started driving people out. I don't think anyone here and here will be wildly surprised that if I said that it was biblical that we shouldn't steal, shouldn't cheat, shouldn't lust, shouldn't lie. That Jesus should affect the way that we live. But yet there will be people who nod that and then think they're an exception. Because we all do it at some time. We all like to think that we're exceptional. Because stealing means what? Stealing from work, stealing from home, stealing from God, just because maybe you want some more money, want some more resource, you don't want to give him what he's due, or what he asked for. Stealing your time from him because you're unwilling to submit to him. Cheating, cheating at work. Cheating at school. Cheating on God by taking what is his. Our lives that are his. And choosing to have them to ourselves. Or even giving what isn't yours to give. Putting lust above God. Choosing not to save yourself for marriage or choosing whilst you're married to, to look elsewhere for, for entertainment and eye candy. Choosing to, to shack up before getting married. They're biblical truths. And yet sometimes we can tempt ourselves, allow it to, to float in there as a, well, it's an exception. Lying to ourselves. Lying to God. Those temple leaders claimed to be following God. 
they claimed to be following God. And they were pious. They looked right. They wore the right clothes on a Sunday morning. But were they right? They were lying to themselves. They recognized Jesus and chose to ignore the truth because he was the truth. And then chose to get the Romans to deal with him just a a few days later because they didn't want to accept what the truth was telling them. So we can't be like them. We mustn't be like them. And I wonder, do you recognize yourself as someone who maybe right now or maybe in your thought process is acting like one of those religious leaders? Seeing Jesus but making an excuse. Seeing Jesus and and thinking that you're exceptional. Seeing Jesus and deciding there's another way round. Not acknowledging who he is, that he is God, that he is Lord, that he is the Alpha and he is the Omega. He's beginning and the end that we need to follow. So, there's no point getting to Easter Sunday and having a, a whoopee doo time if we've not dealt with that first question. Who are you? Who do you say that Jesus is? Because if he's Lord and Master, then he is Lord and Master. If he's king, then he's king. So, this morning, as we end the service, maybe, just maybe, you need to stand to acknowledge him. To acknowledge that he is Lord of your life. If you need to do that in a moment, we'll give you opportunity. That's cool. Maybe you need to sign up for baptism. The end of this month, that opportunity to declare publicly that Jesus is your Lord and your God, then maybe you need to do that. Or maybe you need to kneel, to submit to Jesus. There's space in the aisles, there's space at the front. Maybe you need to speak to someone, we'll be here. There is opportunity. But that question rings, who do you say that I am? So if you need to respond, you want to bow your heads just for a second. If you need to respond, then now is a good time. We should never want to get to the point when we're caught out by God. When we're not willing to respond when he calls us, then we're in rebellion. So if you need to stand, stand now if you need to kneel kneel if you need to sign up to baptism speak to us afterwards and if you need to come down and chat we're here Father God we thank you that you are Lord Jesus we thank you that you are God that you were the Lamb given for us and yet Jesus we thank you now that you are the lion authoritative powerful you're glorious in heaven so Father God we choose to worship you today we choose to set this week right before we we plow on into the busyness of Easter God would you be glorified would you be worshipped let's stand We give God the glory, we give God the honor, and we give God the praise. Amen.